good morning church. It is a cloudy, blustery day over here in Crossville, but I hope things are going well for you. They certainly are over here. Uh, happy to spend a little bit of time with you this morning. So we've been talking about politics for the last little, little while, and these next two weeks we're going to be transferring from um, that subject into the next one, because in two weeks we begin the season of Advent. Advent, of course, as we've talked about the last two years, is the first part of the historic Christian calendar, which is nothing more than a, a discipline engaged by the historic Christian church. Uh, to walk through the life of Jesus every year in the life of their congregation. So it begins with this season early on leading up to a Christmas that focuses on the anticipation of God's people as um, they look for the faithfulness of God to be manifest, for God to keep his promises. It's about learning to wait, about learning to be patient, learning to anticipate and to develop a longing for the fulfillment of God's promises because uh, before Christ came they lived in between the times in between God making the promise and God fulfilling the promise and we live in between times too the coming of Jesus the first time and the fulfillment of the kingdom in his second coming and so we could stand to be a people of faithful anticipation that begins in two weeks um, but every year at the end of the calendar year the last Sunday of um, the Christian calendar is what we uh, might call Jesus is Lord Sunday. And that is that we begin the year anticipating the faithfulness of God. We end the year celebrating the faithfulness of God and the fact that he is Lord. And so since we've been talking about politics, I actually want to spend two weeks talking about this notion of uh, Jesus being Lord. It's been uh, making the rounds quite a bit lately since this is an election year. Lots of people have been talking about the lordship of Jesus. And if Christians were to make a central political claim, and remember politics is not elephants and donkeys or voting on the first Tuesday in November or senators or representatives or writing them or protesting or any of that. Politics is more broadly um, a discussion about how we treat one another as neighbors, how we organize as communities. Jesus is political. At the heart of that political claim is this very simple claim, Jesus is Lord. And of course we have to talk about it quite a bit because oftentimes you look at the world and it seems apparent to all of us that Jesus isn't Lord. And so how can in a world like this we say Jesus is Lord? And so what I want to do is I want to spend two weeks talking about this claim that Jesus is Lord. And I want to start today with uh, kind of bringing a comforting word about it to uh, remind us that our hope as Christians, the thing that, that, that grounds us, that motivates us, that shapes our action in the world, is the claim that Jesus is Lord. And then next week, what I want to do is I want to take up some of the controversy that has been around this. And I want to talk about how to say that Jesus is Lord has to be more than a mere sentiment. It has to be something that calls us to action. If we are going to say Jesus is Lord, we are obligated to obey. And so we're going to talk about that for uh, the next two weeks. But as we start with the claim that Jesus is Lord today, uh, I want to take a look at it from a couple of different directions, but basically what I want to do is I want to remind you uh, in these uncertain times when um, everything seems to be falling apart, when everything seems to be going wrong, uh, where there's all sorts of unrest, where there's all sorts of unknown, where uh, we have a pandemic that is raging, where we have all this controversy around an election, where the economy is struggling, if not in the stock market, then on the ground with actual people living actual lives. I want us to remember in the midst of all of this, no matter where you come from, regardless of who you voted for, regardless of whether you've been sick or whether you think it's overblown or whether you know all too well that it's real, regardless of whether you're doing good economically or you're struggling economically right now, regardless of what is going on, I want you to remember that our hope is in the claim that Jesus is Lord. And this is not just some uh, sentimental thing that we say to make ourselves feel better, but this is a claim that has some real teeth to it. 
And to begin with, I want to say something that I've already touched on kind of a, a base way, which is to say this is the grounding of our hope. Because at the heart of the claim that Jesus is Lord, that he is the one that is in charge, that he is the one who rules and reigns, at the heart of all of this is the notion that God is trustworthy. Because oftentimes when we look at things going on around us and we start to feel the anxiety and the uncertainty and we start to wonder how things are going to play out and we begin to wonder um, what we're supposed to do from here, uh, one of the things that <clears throat> our modern world has taught us well is, and it's false, is that we are essentially by ourselves here. That if God exists, and the modern world seriously debates whether or not God exists, then he is a distant God who is not involved in the world. And so we even in the churches of Christ have conversations about how, you know, miracles have ceased and God works through providence and we might be providentially hindered from going to worship by a pandemic or snow on the road or something of that sort. But we just don't have the language to talk about God being active and God uh, taking a participatory, participatory role in the world. Our language is all built around this, this idea that we inherited from our forefathers in the Enlightenment that um, we are down here in the world that you can see and taste and smell and touch and hear and that God is up there somewhere and he doesn't do a whole lot down here so we're kind of left to ourselves but the Bible paints a very different picture the Bible paints a very different picture and at the heart of that picture is the story of Jesus Christ where God was concerned enough with the world that he actually took on flesh and came down into the world and um, in the life of Jesus, in the story of Jesus, we see God in the flesh taking on this agenda where the love of God, this is the power of God, this is the, uh, the wisdom of God demonstrated in the flesh. The love of God goes up against all of the brokenness of the world in the life of Jesus for the purpose of the healing of the world. And of course, as the love of God goes up against the darkness of the world, what happens is the cross and uh, if you are on that Friday evening outside of Jerusalem, it looks for all the world like the darkness won. The love of God goes up against the darkness of the world and it ends with God hanging on a Roman cross, dead with them taking the body down and putting him in a tomb. But what happens after that, though, is crucial. And when we talk about the cross, we cannot talk about the cross without going on to talk about the resurrection. We have, in fact, a record of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people throughout the Roman Empire in the Jewish territories particularly being crucified. Crucifixion was a very common sort of thing to say that Jesus was crucified would in and of itself not be spectacular. It might have been noble. He might have set a good example in um, living a life that would have led to that moment, certainly. Love can have that effect as you go out into the darkness of the world. Love has teeth when you go out into the darkness of the world. But what makes his story uh, particularly interesting, world-changing, earth-shattering, what makes it the grounding of our hope is not that he died on the cross, but that he died on the cross, love versus the darkness of the world, God versus the darkness of the world, and at the end of the day, what we discover in the resurrection is that God is bigger than all that the world can throw at us. That God is bigger than all of the darkness. That the love of God cannot be vanquished, cannot be conquered by the darkness of the world. And so the cross and the resurrection becomes the grounding of our hope. Because the resurrection is where God reveals himself as being ultimately against death and all of its cohort, ultimately against all of the darkness of the world, ultimately, ultimately against all of the things that this world throws our way that ought not happen. All of the uncertainty, all of the danger, all of the death, all of the corruption, all of the, we could keep going on with that list forever and ever and ever. This is the moment where God says, I am bigger than all of that. And I am not distant from all of that, but I am right in the midst of all of that, and I will prevail over all of those things. 
And it is uh, in God demonstrating his faithfulness through the resurrection of Jesus in response to the faithfulness Jesus showed on the cross. It is in that point that Jesus then ascends to the right hand of the Father. And that ascending back to the Father that we see in Acts chapter 1, that is not Jesus escaping earth. That is Jesus taking his place at the right hand of God to rule over earth. And so at the end of um, Matthew chapter 28, right before we have what we call the Great Commission, we've talked about this before, Jesus doesn't begin with going to all of the world and make disciples. He actually begins with all authority has been given to me both in heaven and on earth. It is to say, Jesus is Lord. In Acts chapter 1, um, or Acts chapter 2, rather, you know, we, we are in the Church of Christ familiar with that phrase, um, or that, that verse in verse 38, Repent and be baptized um, in the name of the Lord for remission of your sins, and you shall be saved. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We're familiar with that, but we're less familiar with the sermon leading up to that where Peter argues that Jesus has been declared Lord and Christ. That is, the one who is in charge, the one who reigns over the world. He is seated at the right hand of God. He has ascended, Peter says. And all of this is, um, all of this is built on the foundation that Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. That's the whole point of his sermon. And so... We enter into this reality, the story that we take up with our baptism and the story that we um, reflect in our communion. And by the way, our communion is, even though it represents the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus on the cross, it anticipates, it includes, it folds in the glory of the resurrection. The cross becomes the victory of God because of the triumph of love, of love over the darkness of the world um, manifest in the resurrection of Jesus. We... We are the ones who come into the world and say that the world is a dark and a broken and a scary place. But in the midst of that darkness and that brokenness, we are not alone. We have not been abandoned by God. This is not the end of the story. We have things to do. Yes, those are the things that we've been talking about through this series when we talk about how the politics of Jesus lays power down and takes up the ethic of love when it looks out for those on the margins, when it loves enemies, so on and so forth. There are things for us to do, but we are not doing it by ourselves. This is not here for us to figure out how to do on our own because Jesus... And his faithfulness on the cross became a manifestation of God's faithfulness in the resurrection. And now he reigns over all things. Now, it doesn't look like that right now. And here we want to remember there are a variety of, of helpful met metaphors. I can't talk. I haven't had enough caffeine this morning. There are a variety of helpful metaphors um, that we might take here. Uh, Jesus, in winning his victory on the cross, won the decisive battle over the brokenness of the world. But it is very common for the war to continue on for some time after the decisive battle has been won. In World War II, they would celebrate um, V-Day. And V-Day, or D-Day rather, happened rather before V-E-Day. D-Day was Decision Day. That was the decisive battle that turned the tide of the war to where it became clear, looking back in retrospect, that the Allied forces would win. But VE Day, the victory in Europe, the day the war actually ended, was uh, a little further down the road. Or, if you wanted to think of it in terms of a banquet. If you've ever been one, to one of these fancy banquets, um, you go into the banquet and there are a variety of courses, there are a variety of stages um, to the banquet. You, you might go in and there might be hors d'oeuvres, the people walking around with little appetizers, tiny sandwiches with uh, toothpicks stuck in them. That's about as fancy as I've gotten as we lead up to the main event as you mix and mingle and then you sit down at the table that you've been assigned to and they bring out soups and salads and things like that. Then there's the main course, then there's dessert. And um, just because we may be in the appetizer section of the dinner, just because we haven't got to the main course or the dessert, doesn't mean that the dinner hasn't started. Or we might say it this way. 
We are the people who have lived in a long, dark night, but even now the sun is dawning on the horizon, and just because the day has not fully broken does not mean that the sun is not now showing the first glimmers of light over the horizon. And so we are the people. And this kind of transitions us into next week. We are the people who turn our back on the darkness of the long night and face the rising sun and act as though the new day has arrived. This is the grounding of our hope. Jesus is risen. Jesus has ascended to the right hand of the Father and is seated on his throne. And even though that final battle has not been won, even though we can still pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we are the ones who say that the decisive battle, if not the final battle, the decisive battle has been won. And this claim has teeth to it. If you go back to the book of Revelation, I'll just throw this one in for free real quick in the last few minutes before I run out of time. If you go back to the book of Revelation, John the Revelator is writing to the seven churches of Asia and they are undergoing intense persecution and troubling times that would make our times look tame. They know what it's like to live in hardship. And when John wants to write to them, his message is essentially this, through all of the weirdness, through all of the, the metaphors, through all of the imagery, through all of the strange storytelling, he says, hold on in the midst of the darkness, live faithfully. It's not passivity. Live faithfully in the midst of the darkness because God is bigger than the darkness. It doesn't dispel the darkness. It doesn't mean that everything is going to be peachy keen. It doesn't mean that everything is going to be great. He says that even some of you are going to die in the face of this darkness, but God is bigger than death. God is bigger than all of the darkness. So live faithfully. Now, final word as we move towards next week. It's awful easy for us to take all of that and to make it some sappy, sentimental, like Thomas Kincaidy greeting card cross-stitchery sentiment. But I want to argue that for us to say Jesus is Lord is far more than just something that we can take comfort from, something that we say in the dark and then sit there huddled up in our circle inside the four walls of our church building. You know, if we could meet safely in our church building now and say to ourselves as the world burns down around us, Next week, what I want to talk about, though, is that to say Jesus is Lord <clears throat> is a call to action. It is a call to be a certain sort of people in the world. And if we are not accepting that call to the certain sort of people in the world, what we're demonstrating is that we don't believe in the power of God. All right. So I'm going to pray for you. And then I'm going to ask you to pray with me. And then we're going to remember who we are as we go out into the world. And remember these uncertain times. Jesus is Lord. That means rather more than we think it, think it does sometimes, but Jesus is Lord. Let's pray. Father, help us to hold on to you as our hope. To not put our hope in the hands of politicians or economists or generals or CEOs or whoever, but to trust in you. That come what may in this world, you have won that decisive victory and you will win the final victory. So we come and we pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. We shall love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind, and with all our strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second commandment is like it. We shall love our neighbor as ourselves, and all of the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. We love because God first loved us. Anyone who says that they love God but hates their brother or sister is a liar. How are you going to love God whom you have never seen if you don't love your brother or sister who is right in front of you? So this is the command we have from him. Those who love God must also love their brother and sister. Church, have a great week. We love you. We hope to see you soon. But until then, we are praying for you. And we are with you 
pulling for you way over here. We'll talk to you later.